Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Cyborg Conspiracy, which is available now. The entire tr Banneker Bones trilogy is available. Go get it. You can get the first book, Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees, as a paperback and audiobook. The ebook is always free to download. Uh, for more information about me, more information about the books and everything that's good in the world, including interviews with publishing professionals and authors, all the best people, head to middlegradeninja.com. That's plenty of intro. For God's sake, there's three of us. We got to get started. Uh, so tonight, I'm, I'm thrilled to be talking with uh, David La Rochelle uh, and Mike, uh, who had a, I had it perfect a moment ago. <laughs> God is my witness, Mike. Uh, who? who well, you got. It's a tough one. Wanutka. I will edit that out so I say it perfect. It'll be <laughs> just solid. But gentlemen, I am thrilled to uh, talk with, with both of you. Uh, I'm talking about your 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 uh, Theodore Seuss uh, winning novel, uh, See the Cat, which I enjoyed very much with my son uh, earlier today. Um, he's seven. He was thrilled. Um, so I'm going to – I don't uh, – I don't uh, – do summaries for the people's books. I don't do summaries for the people's biographies because I want the three of us to still be friends after the show. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourself. And David, we'll start with you. Well, my name is David La Rochelle, and it's a lot easier last name to pronounce than Mike's name, Winutka. Mm -hmm. um, I live in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. Many, many years ago, I was an elementary school teacher. I taught fourth grade. But after teaching fourth grade for about four years, I was offered my first contract for a book, a picture book. And I decided to take a leave of absence from teaching to see if I could make a go at writing and illustrating. And 33 years later, that's what I'm still doing. So I've been working as a children's author and illustrator for 33 years now, mostly picture books and mostly working as an author. I've done some illustrations and I wrote one young adult novel. So. And uh, Mike? Yeah, well, my name is Mike Winutka and I live in Minneapolis. Um, I have been illustrating books for about 20 years. Uh, See the Cat is my 30th book. Um, yeah, I, I just illustrated for um, the first 15 years of my career, and then about five years ago, I started writing my own stories as well. So I have five books of those 30 that I am also the author of. So, and yeah, that's what I do. So I want to do a little bit of kind of a slow build because this is uh, See the Cat is your fourth book together, fifth book? It is our third book together, isn't it, Mike? It is our third Yep. And we have uh, one, two, three, four more books coming out after that together. So we are very, very happy about that. Never in my life have I had that many books in the works coming out. So it's so it's quite exciting for us. Um, and it's also, we always say this, it is so uh, exciting to be doing a book with a friend. As you probably know, Rob, with uh, picture books, the author and the illustrator often don't even know each other. Uh, the editors like to try and keep the authors and illustrators separate, but Mike and I are very, very good friends. And to know the person that I'm working on and illustrating a book has, has been one of the highlights of the, my career. We share the joys together. We share the frustrations together. We call up each other on the phone and we, we complain or we cheer together and that that has been one of the the big pluses of the books we've done together. Yeah, for sure. Yep. And all of those books, um, the four books we have coming out together, are all are all with Candlewick, um, which uh, see the cat is with Candlewick as well. And the good people of uh, Candlewick reached out to me to keep me in great guests, so we're all Candlewick fans here. Good, uh, Candlewick. Too. If you're listening, keep the great guests coming. This is fantastic. Um, so I want to talk about each of you uh, separately at first, and then I want to find out how you come to be breaking all the rules uh, and, and you know each other, uh, even though you're, you're an author-illustrator team. Usually when I do collaborations, I've got to find uh, 
uh, two separate headshots and put those together for the show, but not you guys. I was able to find uh, just an entire <laughs> gallery of photos of, of the two of you together over different drawing tables. So I want to know how each of you came to the art separately and then uh, how uh, you, 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 you came to know each other and became friends and, and worked together. Uh, and since... Um, David, you're the author whose name is on the book first. I'm going to, I guess, make you the first in the rotation. Then I don't know. Maybe we'll change it up. Who knows? Uh, but David, how? what was your first memory of wanting to be an author? And what was your path to publishing your first book? Boy, I remember back in elementary school, I loved drawing and I loved writing and making up stories. Um, that was all, Art was always my favorite subject at school. And I remember my kindergarten teacher uh, Miss Gustafson, when all the other kids would have to go on to different activities, Miss Gustafson would let me sit and keep drawing at the table. And at that point, she was always, I already was feeling like an, an artist at that point because she gave me the special, special permission to keep drawing. And I had teachers who would encourage me with my writing. Uh, my second grade teacher, Miss Stempfley, she kept a story that I had written in second grade and she mailed it to me years later when I was an adult. Um, but I remember she would give me extra time to write. And you just cannot overemphasize the importance of teachers and encouraging kids. And I was lucky I had a lot of uh, teachers who encouraged me. So I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wanted to be just like Charles Schultz. I wanted to be a cartoonist. And as I got older, I thought, well, maybe I could illustrate books. So I went to college. I studied art and English. And I knew when I graduated, I... I would have to make a living at first, so I thought I was going to be an illustrator for Hallmark Cards. I thought that would be my perfect job. And I went down to interview at Hallmark Cards, and they told me, you can't draw well enough for us. So I thought, well, what is plan B going to be? And oh, they don't I sell that card, my lord. <laughs> That's <laughs> devastating. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, I, so I had to go to plan B and I, I had to decide what plan B was. And for me, plan B was to become a teacher. I always liked working with kids. And I went to college for a fifth year. I got my teaching degree. I was working as a fourth grade teacher and writing stories and sending them out to magazines. And I had a story I would read to my students every year. And they always said, oh, Mr. La Rochelle, that's a nice story. Uh, and then one year, uh, a teacher friend saw that story on my desk and she said, oh, David, you should try and get this published. And I said, well, someday I want to write a really good story and get it published. And she said, no, with, this is a good story. And I said, no, 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 I'm going to wait till I write a really, really good story. <laughs> and she said, no, no, th this is great. Um, and I said, no. But she said, well, could I have a copy of the story to read to my students? And I said, sure. Um, and she did read it to her students, but she did something else. Uh, this friend of mine, she called up an editor at a publishing company and she read the story over the phone to the editor. And the editor probably should have slammed the phone down and said, you know, and hung into the conversation there. But the editor said, no, tell that guy to send the story to us. And I did. And that became my very first book. And thank goodness I had that teacher friend who encouraged me because I'd still be telling myself someday I'm going to write a really good story. But I was I was lucky to have Kathy Hawbrick as uh, an encourager in my life, and that, as I said, that was the start of my writing career. The next editor that comes on this show, I'm going to ask them if they would prefer that <laughs> authors' friends call them and, and read their books. <laughs> that's that's got to be a one in a million chance that 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 works out. I'm glad I was that one in a million, Rob. So, uh, <laughs> lucky me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. did, I mean, how did you find out? Is it the editor contact you or she said, does she call you up or come to your room and say, now, don't be mad. But I've done this thing. <laughs> I think it was something like she said, don't be mad. But this editor at our local <laughs> publishing company wants to see your story. And I said, oh, my goodness. So I, I sent it to the editor and boy, I, uh, as you think, it, it's going to be published right away. But we still had many, many revisions to go through before it was published, but it was the start. And it was wonderful because I was still teaching. And as I was working on my revisions, I was reading the story to my fourth graders and they would give me suggestions on how to make the story better. Um, and now 30 some years later, when I connect with those fourth graders who are now in their 
probably 40s themselves, they say, oh, yeah, I remember that story that we helped you write. So they think of themselves as co-authors, as as they should. You know, their feedback was very instrumental um, when I was working on the story. And what a good thing for them to see, too, the revising process. It's it's something we all need to learn. What was the title, David? Was that uh, The Christmas Guest? It was, yep, my very first book, A Christmas Guest. And it was dedicated to Kathy Halbrook, that woman <laughs> who called up the editor. Yeah, she, she sure deserved to have the book dedicated to her. She did. Needs to mention in every book, it sounds like that. <laughs> That's the most <laughs> instrumental, uh, most direct help I think I've ever heard an author receive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Mike, same uh, question to you. When did you know you wanted to be an illustrator and what was the process that got you there? Yeah, so uh, similar to David, as far as, but mine was drawing. I, ever since I can remember, I love to draw. I have uh, three older brothers and they were all really good at drawing and you know, I just saw their drawings and I was determined to be as good as they were. So I was always drawing. So there was lots of drawing in our house. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to be an artist or some kind of artist. And when I was a senior in high school, I entered a statewide competition, the Scholastic Art Show, and ended up getting a scholarship to the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, a pretty good scholarship. Um, our family was not very wealthy and Art school was not on the table for me, but with this scholarship, I was able to go to Savannah and studied art there. And when I got to school, uh, to college, I just knew I loved to draw. I didn't know what kind of careers were out there, um, but I was really fortunate because one of the first weeks of um, college was illustration week. They focused on one major every week and they had these professional illustrators come in, give presentations about their work. And one of the presentations I went to was uh, a presentation by David Shannon. I'm sure you know who that is, Rob, the No David books. And he gave a presentation about how he illustrated his first book, How Many Spots Does a Leopard Have? And it just was a, a lightning bolt moment of just like, wow, you can do that. I, that's what I want to do. And so that was the moment that I decided I want to be a children's book illustrator. And that was my, like I said, it was very early in my freshman year. So then I majored in illustration. Um, I, uh, yeah, took lots of children's book classes. And when I graduated, I did really well in college. And I thought this was going to be so easy to send a few samples out to my favorite publishers. And they would be knocking on my door to work with me as an illustrator. Well, it didn't work quite like that. <laughs> Six years later, after sending samples of my work to publishers after I graduated, and I would bombard them with samples, Rob. Every every month I would be sending new samples and I would get great responses from publishers, but it was always, you know, we love your work, but we don't have a story for you at this time. And and it was hard. It was, uh, I kind of gave up after a few years, got a job working as an illustrator, and then one day I was looking through my flat files and I went through all those rejection letters that I was getting and they were so encouraging. They just told me to keep sending samples and I just said, okay, I'm going to do this. If I had been sending samples the last couple years, I know I would have a book. So that's what I did. I just bombarded them even more so with my samples. And then finally, like I said, six years after I graduated, a random house called me with a early reader called Counting Sheep. And they asked if I would do a sample painting. They had a few other illustrators in mind. So I did a painting, sent it in, and they called me and they said that I, they wanted me to be the illustrator for that book. And that was Counting Sheep. And I have a copy right here. This is, so this was my first book. It came out in 2000, so, so 21 years ago. So six years of, uh, you know, Probably a little bit of self-doubt uh, somewhere along the way. Uh, you're thinking that maybe this is just never going to happen. And then you get that call. It is going to happen. What's that moment like for you? Uh, it was it was an unbelievable moment. I remember I had a terrible cold at the time. And I still was just so happy. And it felt so good. And I was really fortunate because Random House really – they kept me busy as well. So they they gave me a couple more books. I I met another editor 
through at a, a SCBWI conference at Clarion, and she gave me a project, a picture book, um, Cowboy Sam and those confounded secrets. That was my first, you know, big picture book. So I was into, I had broken into two different publishing companies, and that's when my career kind of started snowballing. And knock on wood, ever since that first call, I haven't been without a contract. <laughs> so. I'm knocking hard. <laughs> Mike, were you doing any magazine illustration before you got your book contract? Because I know both you and I have worked for magazines like Cricket and Spider and Ladybug. W were you doing that before you got your book contract? I did, David. That was uh, that was a real. That didn't take quite as long. That took about four years after I graduated to break into getting in uh, to Spider magazine and Cricket and Ladybug. So I was doing a lot of children's magazine work, and I think that really helped me develop my style, um, and that e eventually, I think, helped, you know, obviously get my first book. Well, that builds a nice reputation for you, right? When you when you're able to to say it to an editor, and you went straight to an editor, did, you didn't have an agent doing that on your behalf after six years, did you? So nope. you're, if you're able to go to them, like look at all these uh, fantastic, prestigious magazines that would allow me to to participate in, in, in some of them more than once, that, that's got to speak well to, to, the, to your ability, not only as an artist, but your ability to to be, work with the bull is not a word, but employable maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely think it helped a lot. It, you know, and, and a lot of these illustrations I would do for Spider were stories, you know, so they were short stories. So I would have to do a series of illustrations. And you know, publishers like to see that you can keep a character consistent. So I would do three illustrations for a short story. And I think seeing that work, I think, helped as well. So I love uh, day jobs uh, for, for all the authors who are authors and illustrators who are listening to us, who have yet to get their break, that are doing something else and are, are trying to get there. And obviously, uh, David wins hands down because he was teaching with uh, with the kind of friends that will call up editors. So, so he wins. But for six years, what uh, what were you doing uh, to keep the lights on until your break came? Well, my first job after college was at an art supply store. And then shortly after that, I worked there for about a year. And then I was really fortunate. I ended up getting a job at a sculpting studio where I was illustrating um, things for Disney and Warner Brothers, like little figurines. And for um, people in the studio, they were sculptors and illustrators. And so it was a great job because everyone that worked there, were, they were young, they were just out of college, all trying to start their careers. So I met a lot of very good friends and I met my wife there as well. So she was one of the very talented sculptors <laughs> that I was illustrating for. So that you know, sounds like six years well spent. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have a period where you're where you're washing dishes or doing something uh, completely removed from art, or it was just straight on? I'm focused on art. This is what I do. For me, uh, you, Mike. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, definitely. You know, I was fortunate after art school. Yeah, those were the the two jobs where I had another. I had a. It was a product development job, the sculpting studio. I guess that's what we called it. I did go to another company um, after the, the company I met my wife at. So those were the only three jobs, just those two de um, product development places and the art supply store. So, yeah. And then, and then eventually I, I started getting enough work with the books that I, you know, quit that product development job and just worked as a freelance illustrator. Well, I assume once you got that first book contract that came with the oversized novelty check that was <laughs> that you'd ever need to, to pay all the bills. <laughs> well, I remember my first, that book that I sold from when I was a teacher, Rob, uh, I was paid $600 for that book and without any royalties. So that was all that I made. So I I couldn't live on that for very long. So after I left teaching while I was trying to to 
get my foot further in the door, I was working at a library and as a clerk in the library, uh, putting barcodes on books and paperbacks. So I did that for two years while I was sending more stories out and, and sending things to magazines. Um, and the other thing that I did during, because I've had, unlike Mike, I've had long periods where I haven't had a contract for a book. Um, what has helped me keep uh, paying my bills is that after I'd left teaching, the my first year gone that when I was gone, the principal called me up and said, "Oh, David, would you uh, like to come back and talk to the kids about writing?" And I said, "Well, you know, I really don't know anything more about writing than I did last year when I was a teacher." And the principal said, "Well, uh, we'll pay you." And I said, "Sure, I'll come back." Uh, <laughs> so the principal paid me to come back and, and talk to the kids about writing. Um, and then another school district, school in the district said, oh, will you come out and talk to our kids? And then another one and another one. And that ended up being really how I have been able to make a living is doing school visits for, for many years. That's uh, been my, my main source of income. And for me, uh, it works really well because as a former teacher, I love being in the classroom and I love uh, talking with kids and I miss being a teacher. And now I get to go in and do all the fun things that teachers do without having to grade papers or call up parents or anything like that. So I ended up in the perfect job for me. It was it was just a, a great stroke, stroke of luck. No school board what? meetings for you. Just go do the thing you love and then out. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It's like being the the favorite uncle, or or now I'm old enough. It's like being the the grandfather, where you have fun with the kids and then you give them back to their parents. <laughs> <laughs> they had a lot of candy. I don't think they're sleeping tonight. Well, see ya. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> At least that's how my parents returned my child to me. <laughs> so, okay, so at what point, um, the, I assume a friend doesn't call up and say, hey, uh, you should see David's uh, illustrations. They're also amazing. Uh, so when do uh, publishers find out that you also have this ability as an illustrator? When I I took when I left teaching, uh, I had my artist portfolio as well too, and I went to the editor who published that first book of mine, and I brought in my uh, portfolio for her. And the second book that I published was one that she asked me to illustrate. So I wasn't the author of the second book, but it was somebody else's story. She asked me to do the illustrations for, um, and like Mike, I was. I guess I sent out some of my artwork samples, but I was working a lot more locally, Mike. I was taking my portfolio to uh, either publishing companies here around Minneapolis or magazines around Minneapolis, uh, working for some of the family magazines here and, and sending out art samples to some of those magazines that we had talked about, Cricket, Spider, uh, yeah. Ladybug, and getting work that way. Um, I've done some illustrating, but but more writing. I was doing more illustrating early on in my career. And that worked well with some of the magazine work because I could write stories or come up with puzzles and then be the illustrator for them as well. That that worked out very nicely. Um, but really almost all of the stories I've ever written when I've submitted artwork, they've said, well, we, we like your story, David, but we wanna have somebody else be the illustrator. And uh, they choose excellent artists like Mike to be my illustrator, so I don't complain at all about that. I've only illustrated one of my own books in all the years that I've been an author and illustrator. Um, so again, with artists like Mike, I, I know that they choose the right person to, to do the artwork. That brings us perfect segue to, uh, <laughs> at last, when do these, uh... These two rising meteoric uh, talents uh, collide and 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 create uh, the many wonderful books that we're all enjoying now. Uh, Mike, you want to tell your part of the story, then I guess we'll let David tell the parts that you leave out. I don't know, however that'll work. That sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So David, David and I knew each other. We were, I guess, more acquaintances. We would see each other at conferences, and I knew of David. Uh, I, I mean, you know, he's admired his books at like um, the best pet of all. I remember when that came out and I'm like, wow, that, that's a great book. But uh, I mentioned to a friend of mine, John Coy, that I was thinking about writing and 
you know, I just want, I had just been to New York. I showed my um, portfolio to some editors and my sketchbook as well. And they said that encouraged me to start thinking about writing. So I mentioned this to John and uh, a couple of weeks later, John called me and asked me if I'd be interested in joining their writer writers group, um, which I really hesitated. I, I just didn't think I was ready to do that, but I don't know what got into me, but I ended up saying yes to be a part of this group. And David was a part of this group. And that's where we became much better friends. And um, one day, David brought in this manuscript titled Moo. And I remember when he read it, he brought in some paintings as well. He wanted to be the illustrator. And he was really struggling with the color and just uh, so he brought in some of those paintings and he brought in that little book dummy. And and I knew David would do a great job of illustrating that book. But I just had this vision, Rob, of how I wanted to illustrate that book. It was really strong. And I went home that night and I told my wife about this book. And I just told her, I, I want to illustrate this. I But I know and I honestly felt I would never be the illustrator because I knew David would figure out those colors and he would do a great job with it. So then I just kind of forgot about that story. And then David, you want to take it from there? Well, uh, I, I had this book dummy and I had a, an editor who was interested in, in maybe publishing it. But as Mike said, I wanted to be the illustrator and I just wasn't coming up with illustrations that, that matched with it. And uh, just getting more and more frustrated. And right about that time, I got a postcard in the mail from Mike who was having an art show. And he had a picture of one of his paintings on this postcard. And the picture on that painting was a cow. <laughs> and when I saw that cow, I said, that is how I want the cow to look in this book. And as you might know, Rob, editors don't want the author to go out and find their friend to be the illustrator for the book. The editor wants to uh, decide on the illustrator themselves. But boy, that cow was just perfect. And Mike had published books before and I knew that he would do a good job. So I, after one of our writing groups, I said, Mike, is there any chance that you would be interested in illustrating this book? And Mike said, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I did hesitate because I really did feel like I'm, I'd be taking something away from David, um, but he reassured me that he wanted me to be the illustrator, and I was absolutely thrilled about that. And we approached a publisher that I'd been working with, um, Bloomsbury, had a very good relationship with them, and we sent a sample painting of mine and David's little book dummy. And I think we had a contract signed within a a couple of months. They were very enthusiastic about the project right from the start. So so nobody ever said anything about, hey, you guys can't pick each other. We pick. That never that never came up as an issue. They didn't say that, but they did say the following. Once they agreed uh, to have the two of us be the author and the illustrator, they said, Mike, um, as you're starting work on the illustrations now, please don't show any of them to David. <laughs> even though we're in the same critique group. So what Mike had to do was he would send his sketches to the editor and art director at Bloomsbury. They would look at them. They would send them back to Minnesota to me, and I would make my comments and send those back to New York, and then they would get back to Mike here in Minnesota with, the, with any of the suggestions I might have had that they wanted to pass along. So even though we saw each other every other week in our critique group, we weren't supposed to be talking about the illustrations that Mike was working on. Now, I have it on good authority that no one from Bloomsbury ever listens to this show ever. It's not a concern. Uh, did you guys stick to that? <laughs> uh, just, just us talking. Uh, no, no booms very aware, or or did you occasionally be like, just just before while well, they're not looking? Here, here's the illustration that I have so far here. Critique group. Now I'll, I'll send it to the official channel. We stuck to that for a while, yeah. And then as uh, later on the project, we we bent the rule more and more. And I would say, Mike, that 
now uh, our third book is out We're in the midst of working on, you know, fourth and fifth book, we've gotten less and less, we've gotten more and more collaborative. We share our work much more freely now, right? Almost from the beginning. Um, Mike comments on my manuscripts and I'll run things by him before I'll send them to the editor just because I value his opinion on the story so much. And, and Mike shares his sketches with where at least he talks about them. Um, we don't feel like we have to have our lips zippered shut anymore. No, not at all. I think that is one of the biggest things with working with David. I think we both just have to let our egos go. And we say this all the time that we, everything is about making the best book possible. So if David does a great sketch in the, those dummies, and I sometimes will be very, my final illustration will be very close to that sketch because David captured something the essence of something. So, and so it really is about letting it, our egos go and making everything work for the best book possible. Yeah. And, and Mike give suggestions on the, uh, an idea that might make the book funnier. And even, you know, I, I, I've learned is just like Mike said, we want to make it the best book possible. Yeah. We're, we're, we're both real clear about that. Aren't we, Mike? We are. Yep. And like, David said each book become has become a little more collaborative and which is I think the books are getting better because of that as well. Yeah. That sounds uh, like nothing but win. Um, I'm assuming that sooner or later there's been some sort of disagreement. If not, maybe this is my opportunity to create one. I don't know. Um, but <laughs> it, does it ever happen where, you know, David, you've got a sketch and you say, well, I, I, I feel this is pretty good. And Mike says, well, it's pretty good, but you know, it will be great. And then he whips up something that's that's maybe a little bit better. If you if you ever come to loggerheads, how do you resolve that? And everybody remains friends and the books keep coming. Oh, <laughs> I hope you're not uh, jinxing us. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> something bad is going to happen. Boy, as, you know, as far as, well, like when I share my stories with Mike and he gives me suggestions, uh, I know like our, the, the story, most recent story we we sold, Mike gave me three really good, or three really good suggestions for the story. And I used two of them and, and one of them I didn't. And Mike was okay with that. Uh, he said, "Well, you're making a mistake and not using my idea, but uh, but but we didn't." And when Mike sees my sketches, I just trust him completely to use anything that might be worthwhile. But I also know that he's the professional artist, and what he decides, boy, I'm in agreement with. Uh, you know, I've given some suggestions uh, for improvements for his illustrations through our, the editor, but whatever Mike decides about it, I I trust him wholeheartedly to make all the artistic choices in the end. I, I have complete confidence in him. Yeah. And I, I feel the same way about David as far as, I mean, Rob, I am the luckiest illustrator. I get to illustrate these brilliant concepts that David comes up with. And I just feel, I defer to David. If he feels strongly about something, I, 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 I feel, it's a good decision. So <laughs> I, I think we both have a, I think a lot of respect for each other. So, but if you want to know, there's your once a show <laughs> guest appearance. Yeah. Esteem, esteemed audience watches for her. They know that sooner or later she'll, she'll come along. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, David, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, but if you want to know the area where we do disagree and we do get loggerheads with, there is one, big difference in our personality. We're, we're, our personalities are very similar, which is works well. Uh, we've had to do a lot of traveling together. For example, with our book, Moo, we were asked to uh, come up with a program, preschool program, and travel to 60 libraries across the state of Minnesota giving this program. So we spent a lot of time in the car together. Uh, but there is one area where we differ completely, and that is I am the type of person who likes to get places very early, very, very early. And I have a fear of being late. Unlike Mike, go ahead, Mike. I like to get there on time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel it's rude to get there too early. <laughs> 
no, I yeah, I I am not very good. I'm I'm usually late. I'm usually running behind. Uh, and David definitely. So we had a compromise. He wanted to get to the library an hour before we had to present. We decided on thirty minutes. Was that right, David? No, we, I wanted uh, to get there. I wanted to get there two hours before. Oh, yeah. the event. <laughs> and the compromise was uh, an hour before there, the event. Okay. That's, so. Those poor librarians, what are they going to do with you for two hours? <laughs> I know, that's what I said. <laughs> Don't listen to them, Mike. Don't listen to them. They like to know we're there. <laughs> but we get, we, we, Mike, we surprisingly get, I don't know, maybe it shouldn't be surprised, but we fortunately get along very well. And more, many, many times I've thought there are a lot of people that I could not create books with. Um, it would my our personalities just would not clash or I would be upset or I would get angry and I don't get angry with Mike I uh, I not yet um, but boy our for some reason our personalities mash well enough together that things usually go smoothly and and as I said there's not many people I could do the things that I do with Mike with well this sounds like uh, the perfect uh, author illustrator relationship Everything is going well. The books speak for themselves. We'll, we're going to get to a couple of those and, and uh, talk about those in, in depth a little bit as well. But just out of curiosity, and, and Mike, I'll throw this to you, what would be the argument for the original proposition of keeping both of you as separate as possible and having you only go through the, the, the go-between? What's the upside of that? Or what's the upside of keeping it? Uh, keeping you separate when when this sounds like this is working out so well and why can't all authors and illustrators everywhere do this? Hmm, that's a good question. You know, I think, well, I think the reason it works so well is because David is such a visual person. He is a very talented illustrator. And I don't know if a lot of authors have that visual um, sense, I guess. And I think a lot of or authors that I've talked to that don't have that really like that the illustrator, you know, isn't influenced by um, anything that the author has in their brain about how they think this book should look. So it really, you know, because David is so creative and clever and visual, I love working, you know, collaboratively with him. But there are lots of books that, you know, it, I haven't even met the author before. It's just the words on the page. Um, and it, I guess it's just a it's a different way to work. And I really enjoy that as well, because then I'm, you know, bringing my complete visual um, creation to the project. Um, so it's just a different way of working. I don't know if there's, I don't know if there's really an advantage or a disadvantage of it. I think because it's David, it's an advantage to be more collaborative. <laughs> but does that make sense? I don't know if that's answering the question very well, but. That seems like um, other than you could be, you know, five, 10 minutes late to a uh, presentation if you wanted, <laughs> if, if you're flying solo, <laughs> what are they gonna do? You're, you're Mike, you're the author of uh, the more than 30 books. You've got all the awards. So what are they gonna say? <laughs> they should be grateful you showed. <laughs> no, don't listen to me. This is terrible advice. Right. Right. I think with David, 30 minutes to an hour early is probably a great idea. <laughs> well, and, so, and I'll add to that too that we also both feel very free to be working with other people as well, too. Um, you know, I have a book coming out that somebody else is going to be the illustrator for. Um, and I brought in manuscripts to our critique group, and Mike said, "Oh, yeah, that's a that's a really nice manuscript, but I have no interest in illustrating it." And I, it feels like Mike can be honest about something that. Well, I, I know I've asked him to illustrate things that he said, "No, I I'm I would not like to be the illustrator for that." So we feel like we can create books on our own. And as Mike mentioned, he's uh, Mike is a great author, so he definitely does books that he writes and illustrates that I just sit back and admire. Well, Mike, and that begs the question, what, uh, what's your criteria and when you're deciding what kind of project is gonna be worthy of your time? How do you, how do you make that decision? 
not worthy every time. That's the wrong way to phrase that. <laughs> but something that you would be interested in and feel would be best suited for a project test. Um, you know, it's funny. The, the projects I've worked on with David, there has just been zero doubt in my mind that this project was meant for me to illustrate. Like how to apologize. I instantly knew that I wanted to be the illustrator for that book. And fortunately, David felt the same way. Um, so all of those books that we've worked on together, just instinctively, I knew that I had kind of a vision for it. And I guess that is the the thing. Like when I get stories from other publishers where it is, where, it, where it's just the manuscript and I'll read through it. And I, I like to have at least a couple weeks to read through it, sketch on it. Um, and then it's just kind of, it, does it feel right? Um, you know, I, I I probably turn down more, or I definitely turn down more than I take on as far as manuscripts I get from other publishers, because it really does, I mean, and that definitely was not the case beginning at the beginning of my career. I took everything on, um, but as I get more, you know, projects coming in, I, I'm a little more selective, but it really is. I, I'll take two weeks and I'll just sketch, and if it's starting to, I feel like I have a vision for that story, and then I think it's, I'll take it on. So that's, that's the criteria, I guess. Well, let's talk yeah. a little bit about uh, each of your individual processes, and then we'll come back and we'll maybe talk about uh, Seed the Cat and, and how that goes back and forth. But talking about your individual days first, uh, and David, we'll come back to you. What does your writing day on average look like? What's a good day? What's your schedule like? Yeah. Um, I've learned that I have to, first thing in the morning after I get up, uh, is to sit down and write. Um, and I have to spend the first couple hours of the day working on, on writing or working on a book dummy. Um, more than anything else in the world, I want to create books for kids. But even though I want to do that so badly, I will find every excuse in the world to do something else. Um, I will you know, check my email or I'll do the dishes or I will straighten the shoes in my closet. And once I, once I turn on my email, I, I'm gone for the day. I know I'm never going to get back to writing. So I have learned I have to start by writing in the morning and I'll give myself, sometimes I give myself a couple hours or sometimes I'll give myself uh, an amount that I have to do. I have to come up with you know, a, a page or or three more scenes, or I'm working on a book dummy now, even though I know I will never be the illustrator for it, but it's helping me work out the ideas that I'll do like three pages of illustrations for it. So once I have that part, the creative part uh, of my day done several hours, then I go on to the business part, which is whether answering emails or preparing for school visits or or other mundane things. What time of day is it by then? Is that you've spent all morning and now it's finally time to check email? About what time? Yeah, after sometime afternoon. I'll have my after I work, do my creative stuff in the morning, I'll have lunch and then I'll then I'll go and start checking my email then. Even though by no, nature, email all the way till noon? Yeah, yes. That is a man of iron will and resolve. <laughs> I'm in awe. That's amazing. No, that's that's because I know what's gonna happen, Rob, if I don't. If I if I start looking at email, I'm I'm sunk. It's down the hole I go. And do you have you managed to avoid the trap of a smartphone that has all your emails waiting for you right there? I after a cup, Mike's gonna laugh at this. I'm sure I'm sure he's laughing. Uh, I finally got a real cell phone. I think it's about two years ago. Uh, <laughs> is that about right, Mike? Two and a half. Oh, maybe three. You beat me, David. So I think my I'm on I'm. A, Going on three years, so I think you were a few months before me. So, yeah, so I do have a, a real smartphone now, but <laughs> as Mike knows I have not yet learned how to check my email on my smartphone, and uh, <laughs> Mike keeps threatening to teach me how to do that, and he will one of these days. But so if I'm off someplace, I can't check my email there, which is good, which I think is good. Don't teach him. This is going fantastic. This is <laughs> <I'm jealous>. not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then, Mike, same uh, over to you. What does your ideal workday look like? Yeah, it's pretty similar to David. Uh, I, I, every morning, I start my day with writing in my journal for about 30 minutes. And then um, I'm the same way. I have to do my creative writing right away in the morning. I just 
for some reason I can't do it in the afternoon. Um, so I try to write, I, I give myself a lot less time than David. Sometimes it's just 15 minutes just to do something. Um, but it's between 15 minutes and two hours. And then after I, and this is writing for myself, just coming up with ideas for new stories that I'm writing myself or, you know, stories that are starting to be developed. I'll work on those stories. And then after that, I will work on the illustration project that I'm, um, um, that's under contract. So I will illustrate w whether it's just doing sketches, depending on what phase that book is in, or doing the paintings. And I'll work from, you know, 10 to four o'clock or so, five o'clock painting or sketching out for the book that's under contract. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So it's kind of a nine to five thing for me, basically. But the creative, real intense creative work, the the writing, developing new ideas is always early in the morning. And have you got uh, music playing throughout the day? Or are you able to put on C-SPAN or your favorite movie or something while you're painting? Or has it got to be your 100% your focus? What's that look like for you? When I'm writing, I I can't have any kind of music or anything going on. I just like silence. Um, but when I'm painting or even sketching on a, a book, uh, that's, you know, the, the, the ideas developed um, in painting. I, I like to listen to music, sometimes NPR, but yeah, depending on my mood. So. What would be a favorite CD for you, Mike? Uh, I really like, well, John Prine. He's one of my favorites. He was uh, kind of folky, <laughs> a little more folky. But sometimes if I'm doing something a little looser, I'll put on some more heavy rock and roll, <laughs> like The Replacements or something like that. Right, David, while we're at it, what, are you listening to music while you're writing? Um, well, kind of the same as Mike. If I'm writing, I've got to have it quiet. Uh, and I, I'm too distracted if music is on. Uh, but if I'm working on, say, illustrations for a dummy of a book, uh, then like Mike, I can I can have some background music. Uh, lots of times just really soft music or I'll stream a station that plays music from the 30s, 40s and 50s. So that's my era of listening to music. The music he listen, listened to when he was a child. <laughs> Mike never fails to mention the age difference between us. It was a recent. I think we've come to that disagreement. <laughs> yeah, here we go. There was a recent newspaper article, and in the article they recommended or they uh, mentioned that Mike was a decade younger than I am, and Mike finds every opportunity to mention that he's a decade younger. We both That's celebrated. We both celebrated milestone birthdays this year. Mike turned 50, and I was a decade older than Mike. Well, congratulations to both of you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, double the years uh, going forward, because we, we need more books. <laughs> so, um, where does that take us? I want to I want to talk about uh, See the Cat, which I enjoyed tremendously. But esteemed audience knows I have to ask, and this seems like just the perfect spot because why not? Uh, David, we'll start with you, and then Mike, you'll be next. David, have you ever seen a flying saucer and or a ghost? I have never seen a ghost, and it depends on how loosely you want to dis define a flying saucer. I don't think I've seen a flying saucer. I could say I've seen an unidentified flying object. Uh, I remember a friend and I were camping, a college friend and I, up on the North Shore in Minnesota, Lake Superior. It was at night, we were lying out in the rocks and we were looking up at the sky. And I saw this, this light up there and it was moving in an odd pattern. It was moving and then it moved at a right angle and then I move at a right angle again, and then I move at a right angle again. It was making a, a perfect square in the sky. And I was thinking, well, maybe my eyes are playing a trick on me. And I asked my friend if he could see it. And he said, yeah, he could see it too. And we could call at the same point it was making that 
sharp angle there. Um, so it was definitely something man-made, and we never figure out exactly what it was. Uh, but that would be the closest that I've seen to uh, a flying saucer, though it may not have been that. Wouldn't it be great if it was a man-made flying saucer? Like, they built it for the aliens. Here you go, aliens. We, <laughs> we built <your> ship. <laughs> ah, as opposed to an alien-made flying saucer. <laughs> That'd be perfect. Mm. Uh, it works fantastic. Only flies in the square. So, so long as your destination is within the square of you, you're going to be great. <laughs> I can't. What uh, else? Any idea what that could be? Maybe uh, one of the two of you could explain what would be making that, <laughs> that, uh, that pattern in the sky. I think it's beyond uh, beyond the knowledge of man. Uh, clearly, this is <laughs> there's only one explanation. It's got to be it's got to be from beyond. There we go. <laughs> I don't know, Mike. Do you do you have an idea? I don't. We... I'm sure there's probably a, a bunch of practical explanations. I just never want them to be true, so I'm not going to try so very hard to think of them. Uh, Mike, same question to you: flying saucer and or a ghost. I have a very boring answer, and it, uh, no to both of them. So I think we should, <laughs> we should answer with so far, and then an ellipses, with with the hopes that yes. <laughs> so the next time we we have a conversation, <laughs> you'll say, Rob, I don't know what you did, but I I, I can't stop seeing ghosts since our our previous conversation. <laughs> your, your next question to Mike should be: Would you like to see a flying saucer or a ghost? Would you, Mike? And which one would you rather see between the two? I think I'd rather see a flying saucer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you think that's a possibility that, that that might yet happen for you? Yeah, I guess there's always that possibility. Yeah. What if it was a flying, a flying saucer piloted by a ghost? Then now you could check <laughs> off all the boxes just right there. That would be pretty nice. It's got uh, Elvis and the Loch Ness monster riding in the back. My God, that's <laughs> that's the whole bucket list. Wasn't there a cartoon uh, like in the '60s or '70s called Space Ghost? It was like a a, a ghost who flew a f uh, flying saucer. Yes, there was a. And then there was a talk show I think on the Cartoon Network, uh, Space Ghost Coast to Coast. I think I'm, I'm pretty sure. That sounds so catchy that I couldn't possibly be responsible. For it. I have to have been the title. <laughs> So, all right. Well, moving back to uh, more more terrestrial matters. So let's talk. Uh, see the cap. So this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a grown man, and I was laughing out loud uh, at this uh, poor dog's misadventures being misidentified by I assume uh, you, David. Uh, <laughs> I assume you've done this to Max, the the poor dog, uh, that have identified him as a, as a cat since you are the the author. So how how I know the question. Where do you get your ideas come from? Uh, is absurd because who knows? Um, but at the same time, this is this is a concept. I it, it, it floored me when I read it. Like, why haven't I read this before? This seems like a concept that that should already exist, and yet I I can't remember ever encountering this misidentified character. That's his whole um, problem for a good part of the story seems to be that the author is messing with him. <laughs> so how 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 did you come up with that? And then how long did it take you to to realize that? Boy, some books I know instantly where I got the idea from, and some are are a lot vaguer. And this is one of those vaguer ones, Rob. Um, I know that I had wanted to write a book at one point in which the the book itself was the character, and I had tried that with books before, where the the book is saying, "Oh, thank you for taking me off the shelf. It feels good to have my pages turned." So I had that idea in the back of my mind. Um, and I always like that idea where of having a book where the text does not match up with the words. And I know there must be other books that do that as well, too. What the words are saying one thing, but the illustration is something different. So those two things. And I combine those in this idea where it's like a beginning reader, see the cat, except it's not a cat on the page, it's something else. And what I did was I brought in, uh, I made a little dummy of the book. And this is what I brought into my writing group. It's just some simple pages with my sketches. You know, see the cat? The dog says, I am not a cat. I am a dog. And Rob can see this, but if I were to show, you know, my illustration here, I can then show 
Mike's illustration, and you can see why I like having Mike for my illustrator instead of me. Um, but yeah, so I put together this little dummy of the book and brought it into my writing group. And I believe Mike said afterwards, uh, David, I really like to illustrate that book. And I said, boy, thank goodness. That's what I was hoping you would tell me, Mike. That's kind of how it went, wasn't it? It was, yeah. <laughs> I was very, very excited that you thought the same thing, David. So. It's kind of love at first sight. <laughs> Definitely. And we, I sent it, yeah, we sent it off to an editor at Candlewick. I had published one book with her that somebody else was the illustrator, uh, Isle of You, illustrated by Jamie Kim, a great illustrator. But uh, we sent my little dummy of the book along with a sheet of sketches of Max that Mike had done and all the different expressions of him. And we sent sent them to the editor saying we would like to do this book together. Right away from the start, we knew we wanted to do it as a team. Mm -hmm. And our wonderful editor at Candlewick, Andrea Tampa, said, we're on board with this looks great. Do you want separate contracts or do you want to share the same contract? I remember that's what she asked us. <laughs> What uh, what is the right answer to that question? Should it ever come up for anyone listening? Well, for us, we said we wanted separate contracts, and that's the way it's always been. And so, any sort of negotiations we do independently of each other. I don't know how other teams would do. Do you have yeah. any, idea, Mike? Yeah, I'm not sure. I it definitely. Yeah, we both we David and I we don't have agents, but we both have lawyers or attorneys that work look at our contracts. So they both advised us to have them, the contracts be separate. So. I mean, I would think, I'm trying to think why it would be an advantage to have one contract for two people. Well, we think that might diminish. I don't know. I, I don't know if it, would, if it would be a problem at all. It could be I'm just making a mountain out of a molehill. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And then Mike, so you're in love with the book. You go home and you start doing sketches or you do them right there um, with David kind of looking over your shoulder. But that, that's not what I want. <laughs> do it this way. Don't do that. Yeah. yeah, so my job after um, Candlewick agreed to publish this as a team um, is really just starting to sketch that character, Max. And I've got lots of sketches here. I've got pages and pages of Max. Um, and I was quoted saying that I I illust or I, I drew Max hundreds of times just to capture that specific emotion on each page. And I felt like, well, was that an exaggeration? So I went through my sketches and I counted the number of times I drew Max. And I think I counted I found some more sheets, David, last time I told you. So I think I came up to about 267. So I, I do a lot of sketches, and it seems a little silly, but I just sketch and sketch and sketch until it looks like I didn't have to work at all to come up with that pose or that emotion. So, yeah, so that's my job after accepting the project is just coming up with the sketches, and then the next step is doing the final art the, the final paintings. So, and I'll do lots of color studies for those. And this is just an example of some of the color studies. And the color study, that's to give uh, David and the, the editor and everybody involved a, an opportunity to say, no, the color you've chosen, eh, this one instead, or? <laughs> yeah, it, just so I'm, we're all on the same page. Um, I always do color studies. I work with a designer, Lauren Petapis at Candlewick, who is wonderful to work with. And so just to make sure, like I said, we're on the same page and they and she'll share that, those paintings with everyone else at Candlewick. And yeah, you know, once I get the go ahead, then I have a, a few months to do all the paintings and I'm kind of on my own at that stage just working in my studio doing the final art and is there any uh level of of intimidation just because if you know if uh, we were say writing a book called i don't know maybe see the cockroach 
there's there's a lot of open territory with cockroaches that hasn't been explored. But when we're do, when we're doing dogs and cats, that's uh, <laughs> that's there's a lot of illustrated dogs, a lot of illustrated uh, cats out there, and yet Max is is his own new separate thing. Um, He's obviously a dog, but he's he's very much a character in and of himself. So how do you do you ever worry about I don't, I don't know if there, do, do you go out and you look at all the other dogs that are available and say, this is going to be the type of dog I draw? Or do you just say, well, by virtue of the fact that I'm drawing it and it, it, the inspiration is passing through me, it will be a, a, a Mike original. <laughs> yeah, I think the latter, I think. You know, those, I don't know if I have any really early sketches, but, you know, I really played around with different types of dogs, you know, smaller ears, smaller noses, big noses, long ears. And that's one thing with David's, uh, that little book dummy, one thing I really loved about his sketches that the, the Max did have these very expressive ears, the longer ears. And it is a, it's a matter of just sketching it over and over until it feels right. It feels like the dog for this book. Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of the, the process of just sketching and sketching and sketching until it starts feeling right. And of course, you guys have got a sequel coming. Uh, see, see the cat. I'm sorry, see the, see the dog. Uh, three stories about a cat. Uh, mm -hmm. So when in the process... Does it occur to you that you expand the universe or is it something when the book comes out and everyone says, oh, my God, this is amazing. And you guys start winning all the awards. Like, all right, let's well, a sequel time right now. <laughs> when in the process do you find out there's going to be another book, David? Well, we had finished uh, See the Cat and had a, I don't think it had come out yet. No, it hadn't come out yet. Uh, but Mike had finished the artwork. And Mike told me, you know, David, I think I think Candlewick is going to ask for a sequel to the book. And Mike knows that I do not like sequels. Uh, I I'm not fond of them because so often, at least I feel the sequels are just often telling the same story again. So I'm I'm not a real big fan of sequels. But Mike said, you know, I think Candlewick is going to ask for a sequel. And I said, oh, no, I don't want to do a sequel. So the next week, Candlewick asked said, oh, would you be interested in doing a sequel? It was before the book was even published. And then Mike told me, you know, David, I even have the title for the sequel. The title should be See the Dog, Three Stories About a Cat. And the instant that Mike told me that title, in my mind, I got a completely new approach that would work for the, the second book, where it wouldn't just be the same story again. So Mike can take all the credit for not only coming up with a title, but that title was what triggered the storyline for the next one. Because I thought, oh, Baby Cakes, the cat, the way Mike drew it, her in that first book, I could just picture her personality. If she, if she's going to be the star of this next book, this next book is going to be a completed or a very different type of book. Mm -hmm. So thank goodness for Mike for for nudging me to do the sequel. And we both are very grateful that we were done with the sequel and had sold the, actually the third book in the series before See the Cat won any awards because I that would be just too much pressure in the world to try and come up with something once a book had done well. So both and Mike and I were happy about that. So yeah, so that's the book I'm currently working on, Rob, is the third in the series and it I don't know if you know the title of that, Rob, but it's See the Ghost, Three Stories About Things You Cannot See. <laughs> so that should be just right up your alley, Rob, with Ghost yeah. in the title. Yeah, you've got uh, until that book's done to go, go find some ghosts for the necessary inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will send you some links of haunted places near nearby to go see. <laughs> That's good. Actually, there's a couple where you can uh, watch uh, webcams live, and they'll just they'll, they'll put it in the haunted uh, house, and you can just have that going while you're drawing, and look up every so often to see if a ghost has come by. You'll, you'll be in good shape. So, see the ghost. That is, uh, and obviously, we, we we can't say too much about a book that's 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 not, that the Steve audience won't won't have the opportunity to read for a little while. But that is a I, I want to say left turn, but in honor of the flying saucer, I think we'll say right turn. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> hard right angle turn. Um, from so cat ghost. I'm sorry, cat dog. 
that makes sense. Where where did we get to Ghost, or is that is that a surprise? And was the Ghost secretly making a cameo in the previous two books, and we didn't know? <laughs> well, the Ghost doesn't appear in the first two books, but both the dog and the cat, Max and Baby Cakes, appear in the third book. So they're those two characters are are uniform through all three books. Um, and I guess that, well, Mike gave me the title for the second book, but for the third book, it was trying to think of some sort of wordplay because the first two you have that, see the cat, it's a story about a dog. Well, that doesn't make sense. See the dog, it's a story about a cat. That doesn't make sense. So trying to think of that same pattern, see the something, what would make not make sense? See the, <laughs> well, see the ghost, three things you cannot see. Well, that wouldn't make sense about things you... So uh, I guess that's where it came from. And then tried to think of three things that you cannot see that you can write a story about. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> if you can't see the ghost, how do we know it wasn't there the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mike was very happy with this third book because there's so many things he just doesn't have to draw because yeah. you can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> After two books, third book, you can sit back and just get paid, right? Woo! Yeah. <laughs> so where does it, does it go from here? It's, I mean, that can't be the end. Uh, this thing is just picking up steam. You're winning awards now. People are going to continue to fall in love. You're going to be on this podcast, and that's going to, I assume, skyrocket the sales even further. <laughs> uh, and so we, we've got a plan for, what, at least five, six more books. Do you, do you foresee this going on, or is three going to be, that's enough for now? We want to stop at 10. I think that's <laughs> the number we've decided on, Rob. Yeah. Right, David? As I keep telling Mike, three is such a nice number. It's got that that uh, three is a magic number. So I'm I'm looking at three. Mike's looking at ten. I got I have to keep that contract streak going, David. <laughs> <laughs> this is a this is a cash cow. You're gonna be uh, <laughs> twenty thirty books. You're gonna no. Be that that order. was our first our yeah. first book was the cash cow. Rob Moo that one. <laughs> Oh, is that right? That was our cash cow. Oh, oh, right. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm so slow to pick up that joke. I'm embarrassed for myself. Oh, let's move on. <laughs> well, could we see uh, additional uh, books set in the Moo universe, do you think? Oh, I don't know. Mike, you never pushed me for another Moo book, have you? You were pretty adamant about that one, David. Yeah, and I still am now. That Cow has her one book, and that's that. She would want to have a whole series about her. That's her personality. And to see the cow, three stories about a cow is what she would want to have. <laughs> um, but no, I think think cow in her book Moo is is going to be a standalone book. Even when Moo Two is a title, it's just right there. <laughs> <laughs> or or more Moo, or what are you going to do? That's pretty good too. <laughs> I don't know. I think Seed of Cow is pretty good. I like this uh, this crossover. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go, David. I think, yeah, I think you're, I, Mike's right. I think you're going to reach 10 books. <laughs> <laughs> well, we look forward to coming back again in the near future to talk about books five, six, and seven. <laughs> <laughs> So well, how, how obviously you're working on the third book now, how far out typically are you from readers? Um, are you a couple of books ahead of them or how, 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 how often do you have books that your books you can't even tell me about right now that you're working on that will eventually come to us? Um, this is about as far out as I've been in my career because we have see the ghost and then we have another one under contract on um, that has no, it's not part of the series or part of how to apologize series. It's just a standalone picture book with Candlewick. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's about the farthest I've been out where I'm working on a book, a contract, one contract ahead of me. How about you, David? All right, yeah, this is clearly the farthest out that I've had books or had this many books in the works. Um, it, uh, after 33 years, it feels pretty good to be at this page because usually I'm, I feel lucky if I can sell one book a year. And I've definitely gone through periods where I haven't had a book under contract and just hoping that sometime soon I'll sell another book. So this is, this is real rare for me and I'm enjoying every minute of it. 
And so what's it like now that uh, as see the, the cat is out uh, and you've won the, you know, the Theodore Seuss Geisel Award winner of, of 2021, the ALA Notable Children's Books. Uh, you're an Amazon Best Book. Uh, people like this book. It's going well. What's the experience of winning that award and of, of hearing this kind of feedback after uh, working hard, knowing that you're definitely got two more books? So it's it's good that the readers are primed. But we just tell ourselves over and over again every time we're on the phone how lucky we are um, and what a difference winning an award makes. Uh, in some ways, it's it's really sad because there are uh, so many good books out there that don't win awards, and they they come and they go pretty quickly, and they don't get that, that they don't have, get those sales, they don't get that recognition. But and a lot of those books are our books, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have plenty of those that have come and gone as well. We can both talk about examples of those, um, but. Having won the this award, the Geisel Award, uh, it, it we get asked to be on podcasts like your podcast that we, we never got asked these things before. We get interviewed by newspapers and and just all the 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 positive things we've heard say on uh, Goodreads, people who are enjoying the book that it just builds on itself and it's a, a wonderful thing to have. have happen because it sure doesn't happen all the time and and for us we're i'm just grateful what happened in my career at all mm -hmm. because a lot of really good authors and really good illustrators never get a book that that wins a significant award and and we were lucky enough that we did and if we never win another award i feel happy with with what we've had with the success of uh, of our books yeah this has always been well, a dream that I thought was unattainable. So I, it just feels really, um, just feels really good. I didn't think it would ever happen. So it, like David said, if we don't win another award after this, it, that we've, we've hit the pinnacle <laughs> in a lot of ways, which feels really good. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, and that's, that's the thing. We, David and I both love what we do and we want to just keep creating great books and we know that not all of them will be this successful. And that's okay. I mean, as long as we can keep doing it, uh, keep creating books, um, whether they are award winners or not, this is, you know, what we're meant to be doing. <laughs> and we feel pretty lucky that we get to do it as our jobs. Uh, so. Well, not anymore. You guys are next level now. It's it's all awards and uh, <laughs> prestige from here on out. I did uh, I did see David that you. I saw part of an interview where you mentioned casually that you had managed to win forty thousand dollars for twenty five words. How does that happen? Oh, now that's a that's another uh, chapter of my life. For many years, Rob, I was a contest enterer. Uh, entering contests, jingle contests, um, and a lot in those first years when I was working as a children's author and illustrator, there were times when I would win a contest that would pay my rent for the next few months. That's really how I got by. Um, I started entering contests back when I was a kid. First, I was entering coloring contests in elementary school, and I would win prizes, and that you know really got me going. But I won my first major jingle contest when I was in junior high. There was a contest sponsored by Shasta Soda Pop, and you had to say in 30 words or less why Shasta's 14 flavors of pop are more fun than one. So I sat down, I wrote my entry, I sent it in, and I was one of the national winners. So my <laughs> prize for that contest is a 14-year-old kid. I won a seven-minute grocery shopping spree. I got to go to our local grocery store in the morning before it opened up, and I had a grocery cart. They seven minutes to get as much food as I could back on that conveyor belt checkout. I got to keep for free. So, what uh, uh, adult uh, training you to go straight to the meat section? Oh, or, yes, that, or what, what did you put in your cart? You, you nailed it, Rob. My mom said, okay, first of all, you're going to the meat department. 
<laughs> that's what I, I did a whole entire cart full of meat, uh, steaks and roast. And part of the rules of the contest was it had to be unloaded during the seven minutes as well, too. Oh, wow. And anything you didn't get unloaded would stay in the cart. In that. Exactly. And, but luckily, the store had those carts uh, which have the the little the little trap door on the end. So I would you know, bring it back to the conveyor belt, trap, lift that door down and just shovel it all up. Right? <laughs> then on to the next one. Uh, the second cart was all frozen food, uh, like frozen shrimp and things. And the third cart was all junk food. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, when I just, you know, the cookies and all things into the cart. So I got three carts full of food unloaded, and then they blew the whistle saying I only had one minute left, so I knew I didn't have time to go out with the cart again. So I just ran back and forth grabbing armloads of things. <laughs> armloads of dish soap, you know, eight, you know, ten things of, of dish soap. And I went and I grabbed a birthday cake, and because I like birthday cake, and just... <laughs> and then they blew the whistle, and the time was up. <laughs> Is there a video of this at all, David? No, there's not. But there's some some photos from the local newspaper, which are fun to see me, this this scraggly little 14 year old kid running through the store. But boy, you can imagine, Rob, after winning that, I was hooked on winning on entering contests. And I was I was entering them all the time and winning some some nice prizes. Um, they don't have as many contests as they used to. There's a great movie, and it actually started as a book, and they made it a movie that came out a number of years ago called, called The Prize Winner of Defiance, Ohio. If any of your listeners want a great movie, uh, just a feel-good movie, Woody Harrelson was in it, and I'm trying to think who the, the woman was. But it was based on a woman in the 50s who kept her family, her large family of kids, a solvent by winning jingle contests. That's what she did. She was a housewife and she wrote jingle contests. And, and, and in the fifties, they had a lot of contests like that. By the time I was in, you know, in the seventies and eighties and nineties entering these, there weren't quite as many, but I did, I, I several times, twice I won $10,000 in contests. And you mentioned the last one for uh, 25 words or less to say how, um, uh, how healthy choice foods make me feel like a million. How does healthy choice make you feel like a million? You know, 25 words or less, I won $40,000. And I knew I would never top that. So that was kind of the last contest I entered. Well, I think before our esteemed audience hears this and starts entering all the contests, uh, before this comes out, I'm going to start entering all the contests. You've convinced me. What are we messing around with books for? 40,000 books or 40, yeah, 40,000 books for 25 words. That's. <laughs> I, I figured out how much it was a word at one point, And boy, it's uh, I've never got a contract for $40,000. You can believe me. <laughs> uh, and then. Um... I want to ask a little bit about school visits, and then we'll we'll think to, about calling it a night because I I know it's uh, getting ever late, and both of you uh, have got snow coming down as we're talking. Um, but I did want to ask quickly about uh, being a professional pumpkin carver because I think you're the first professional mm -hmm. pumpkin carver I've ever talked to. How does one become a professional pumpkin carver? With a contest, Rob. There you go. I, I, <laughs> exactly. Yes, I. Uh, back when I was a teacher, I saw these carving kits. You see them all over the place now with those little tiny knives. Um, but when I was a teacher, they just came out and the, the carving kit had a contest on it, a pumpkin carving contest. So I saw the word contest and my eyes just lit up. That's the way I worked. So I got the carving kit, uh, uh, came up with a design, sent a photo in for the contest and I, I won a prize and I was just hooked. I kept carving pumpkins and they became more elaborate. And a local newspaper did an article about it. And uh, then a local TV show saw the newspaper article. And from then, the, the local gardening woman was on Good Morning America and she needed pumpkins there. And then next thing I know, I was being flown out to New York City to carve pumpkins on Good Morning America in the morning there. How old were you then, David? Uh, when was this? I was probably in uh, my late 30s or maybe 40s by that point. Okay. Yeah. And are so. you uh, calm and cool as a cucumber? Or is, your, is your knife shaped and so bad that you're just mincing right through the, the pumpkin as you're on Good Morning America? 
<laughs> well, I, I, I was carving away pretty fast there. My, my story about Good Morning America is I was carving, getting all the things set up in the morning, and this guy comes up to me and says, oh, those are pretty nice pumpkins. And I thought he was the janitor. And then a little bit later during the show, it turns out he was Emerald Lagasse or whatever it is. He's a, he's a famous cook who's on the show, but I don't ever watch TV, so I had no idea who this guy was who was you know, complimenting me on my pumpkins. Um, but that was, that's probably best. <clears throat> and, but it all went by so quick. The next, As soon as the show was over with, they showed me the door and said, oh, you can go home now. And I was home again within 24 hours after I had left Minnesota. Wow. Wow. Just in and out. Carved the pumpkins. Thank you very much. On your way. <laughs> yep. now, the next year, they wanted pumpkins again. And I said, oh, you're going to fly me out? And they said, no, we just want the pumpkins. We don't want you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and that was the year I learned you can ship carved pumpkins by mail. I thought that was impossible. But they said, no, bring it down to the UPS store. They packaged up the pumpkins. The next morning, I turned on the TV, and there were my pumpkins on Good Morning America. Just bubble tape and then in a box? or I guess so, yeah. I, they, I left them at the, at the UPS store, and they were the ones who worked their magic on it. They, and they, worked, they did their magic well. Uh, and then, Mike, I wanted to, to turn back to you for uh, school visits, and then we'll, we'll uh, think about uh, winding this thing down. Because uh, I always want to end while we're while we're still having fun, um, but when uh, the two of you go to a school visit and you are uh, an hour ahead of time as opposed to two, uh, the the negotiated time, what does that day look for you? What can all of the listeners who are thinking these guys are fantastic, I want to have them come to my school, what can they look forward and expect to happen when you show up? Well. I always do some drawing, of course, um, some interactive drawing with the kids. Um, and we always read Moo. Moo is always a big hit. Um, it's always an interactive reading. There's nothing like hearing 300 students in a gymnasium reading or mooing all together at the same time. So that's always a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and when David and I do presentations together, you know, we talk about the process of creating the books together. Um, yeah, and then what else, David, would we talk yeah, about? We, here? we often show a PowerPoint, uh, and, you know, like the studio of where we work. Uh, I, I'll do that when I'm doing my presentation on my own. I know you do that as well, too. We show the yeah. process, showing sketches. I always talk about all the rejection letters that I give when go to school visits. I show my stack of 198 rejection letters I've received over the years. And kids ask if I still get rejection letters and I tell them, no, I do not. I get rejection emails now. I don't get rejection <laughs> letters. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah. And, and, and just while having Mike illustrate, that is always a uh, huge hit. I love watching Mike draw and Mike just mesmerizes the kids when he does drawing. And often, you know, when we work together, I will solicit ideas from the kids that Mike can then add to his drawing. Mm -hmm. So I try and choose the kid who's going to say something <laughs> that I know Mike doesn't want to draw. No and, horse. Uh, oh, a horse. Yeah. Draw a horse now, Mike. Yeah. Put that motorcycle. Horse. <laughs> what's, uh, what, what's wrong with horses? I just have a difficult time drawing them. Uh, yeah, originally, Baby Cakes in See the Cat was riding in on a horse, and I suggested, I think uh, a unicorn would be much funnier, David. But secret, <laughs> secret, secretly, I just didn't want to draw a horse. So, <laughs> why, why is a, a, a unicorn, which granted has the additional appendix that a horse does not, or not an appendix of the, 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 the horn? Um, yeah. Why is that easier for you to draw than a horse? I, I think you can have more fun with the color. Um, it just seems like you can be a little more creative with it. Uh, so it, I don't know. It doesn't uh, have to look so stringent, maybe. I don't know. You just have a little more creative freedom with a unicorn. I know. They're very similar, obviously. <laughs> but it, it just seems – and unicorns – can be pink, and uh, that's a 
better than brown, I guess. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. They're more magical. How far about book number four, See the Horse? Three <laughs> stories about lots and lots of horses. <laughs> you have to see if Mo Willems is available. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> We're in the uh, hopes of, um, of, of of providing uh, future students with ways to, to stump you uh, at school visits. Are, is it is it limited to horses or other things that you just avoid drawing? Do you, do you have a list? Um, well, the only other thing that comes to mind when David and I would do these the Moo tour, where we did, visited sixty different libraries, cow would be riding something, and the kids would pick <laughs> and. I just didn't want them to pick a bicycle or a motorcycle. Those are always difficult to have a cow riding a bike or a motorcycle with the wheels and the having her be able to reach the pedals. It's always a little tricky. So motorcycles and bikes are up there with horses. But you did both of those, Mike. I, I've seen you draw a cow on a motorcycle, a cow on a bike, cow on a snowmobile. I've seen you draw... I remember we were at one event and uh, said, what, what should we have Kyle drawing? And the, the, the kid said, uh, riding a potato. Yeah. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Mike did. Yeah. Boy, Mike could pull out any of these things. And uh, you, you did some pretty creative stories on that Moo tour, Mike. Pretty creative illustrations. Well, thanks, David. <laughs> Jim, this has been an absolute pleasure. Um, these are wonderful stories uh, all around. Uh, and I think we've all learned a lot. And certainly we've, we've got the idea that you two are a match made in heaven. Uh, this is a, a perfect working team here that uh, everyone who's listening that, that has the opportunity to get you to come on uh, for their school visits, their podcasts, their whatever it is they've got going. Uh, these these are the fellows that you want to see more of, and and, and want to see those uh, ten different, uh, well, seven additional sequels beyond See the Ghost. I am looking forward to that. Uh, my final question is always some variation, and uh, Mike, I'll throw this one to you first. Um, if you could go back and give yourself some advice at any point in uh, your career that would have made things easier for you and might make uh, the path easier for everyone listening. What would you go back and tell yourself? It's a tough question. Um, you know, I definitely would have would encourage myself to have started writing my own stories earlier. Um, I think that would have been. You know, it's just such a fulfilling thing to write your own stories. Um, I definitely feel like I would be further along with that part of my career. Um, but also, I guess I would tell myself at this at any stage in my life is just don't worry so much <laughs> um, about, you know, things have a tendency to work themselves out. And, you know, I, I keep a pretty uh, extensive journal throughout my, for the last 25 years. And David does this as well. And it's so, uh, you know, it's it's really um, I don't know what the right word is, but it just feels good to look back and think about look at things that you worried about so much, and then you realize how it worked out, and that thing wasn't something to worry about. Uh, so I guess that's my best advice to myself: was to not worry so much, and to maybe start writing a little earlier than forty. So. <laughs> Uh, David, same question to you. What would you go back and, and give uh, a pass to you? Mike stole my answer there. Yeah, yeah. He, he said what I would say. It, if well, I go could... back and tell past you to say that before Mike does. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Yeah, I would tell myself um, things are going to work out okay. Uh, there, Especially when I was young, there were some things that were uh, I had lots of great, I had a happy childhood and all that, but there were also some things I was really struggling with when I was growing up and a young adult, uh, just to tell myself, it's going to work out okay. You you can grow up and have a happy life, David, and I did. Uh, but I, at times I, I worried about that a lot. And as Mike said, so so many of these things that we worry about never come to fruition. Um 
and it doesn't do us any good to worry about it. And things so often work out. They sure have in my life. I, I feel so fortunate about so many things. Well, yeah, the uh, grocery shopping contest alone. My God, <laughs> every day is coming up, David Lavishel. Huh. And pumpkins, and pumpkins too. <laughs> Where uh, can esteemed audience find you online, follow you on social media and all that good stuff? I think both of our uh, websites are pretty easy. My website is davidlarochelle.com. And as somebody who just got a cell phone a couple of years ago, I'm not on Twitter, uh, but my uh, just regular on Facebook. I don't even know what my Facebook address is. But uh, davidlarochelle.com, you can get my website and you can connect with me that way. There's a link to send me an email and you can find out what's going on in my life. That's that's the best way to connect with me. Yep. Uh, yeah, my website is mikewinutka.com. And I am on Instagram, um, post a few things there, and Facebook. So, But if you go to my website, you have, there are links to all of that through the website. And as always, esteemed audience, for uh, interviews with all of the greatest authors, editors, literary agents, publishing professionals, folks I know you're going to love. I wouldn't steer you wrong. Head to middlegradeninja.com. Download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Beans to prepare you for Banneker Bones and the Cyborg Conspiracy. And God willing, I'm alive. I'll see you next week.